Now, we can make ammonia from solid state synthesis. It works kind of like that solid fuel cell in reverse. Again, lab scale, NH3 Fuel Association did some papers on this. They estimated, and we adopted it, about 6,800 kilowatt hours of electric power are consumed per ton of ammonia produced by this process. It helped a little with extra heat. Suppose we did that at 6,800 kilowatt hours per ton. Translate that into costs. That's about penny a joule for energy from ammonia produced that way. Whereas today's gasoline is about three cents per joule. Remember joules a watt second? Then I looked at the California state analysis of their gasoline costs, and uh, you know, more than half of them are from the crude oil that goes into the gasoline. So I say, well, that's the energy content. You know, the taxes and distribution, refining, those are all going to be the same. Suppose we used ammonia. What might we get? Well, we might get mm, a third of that cost, because it's only one cent instead of three per, per joule. We could reduce the cost of the gasoline equivalent. Now, I'm making the leap of faith that engineers can create uh, refineries that can produce this kind of ammonia fuel as efficiently as do today's petroleum refineries. Well, suppose you don't like the hydrogen and you don't like ammonia. We have to go back to carbon, but we don't want to take it out of the ground. What are the sources for carbon that do not uh, pollute the atmosphere more? We like to make these kinds of uh, chemicals. One is the project called Green Freedom, which was uh, done at Sandia. Uh, n never done, just designed. And the idea was to use a liquid in the cooling tower of a nuclear power plant that was saturated with sodium bicarbonate. Uh, when sodium bicarbonate is heated, it uh, exudes CO2. That's how baking powder works in your kitchen. So you can capture that CO2. A guy named Jim Holm in the thoriumapplications.com website has another scheme using the cooling canals of a nuclear power plant, such as the one in Florida, to do the same kind of thing. So that's a potential way to do that. Of course, we can also do that by getting carbon from agriculture. Now, farming produces about three tons of dry biomass per acre per year, no matter whether it's switchgrass or corn or, or trees. Uh, and about half of that is carbon. But let's not burn it. Let's not do what the ethanol people do. Let's use the carbon in it to be the carbon that's going to go into one of those hydrocarbon fuels. We'll add hydrogen to it in order to create the fuels. We'll get about a 3 to 1 fuel improvement ratio doing that. About 1.7 tons of biomass would yield a ton of fuel. US farmland is about a billion acres. Um, we use already about a billion tons of fuel a year, we'd have to reduce that a lot in order to be able to satisfy our fuel appetite in the US. Uh, but on the other hand, if we didn't burn coal, we wouldn't have so much diesel fuel burned in trains. Half of the train traffic in the United States is hauling coal to power plants. We can electrify the rest of the railroads. We can do better. So we might be able to live with that source. Cattle dung is burned in a lot of countries for fuel. But it's a source of carbon. Same thing. A world cattle dung is about 2.5 gigatons per year. That could make a lot of fuel if we could collect it and burn it. So there are other sources of waste hydrocarbons that we can consider as sources to make carbonaceous fuels. In summary, I say try and develop this technology. And my, I advocate public domain ownership of the R&D of the first five years. Produce and export it. Zero out coal plant CO2 emissions. Synthesize climate neutral fuels. Avoid the contentious carbon taxes that mean that the meetings such as Durban uh, never succeed. Improve world prosperity by raising people out of energy poverty and that check the overpopulation growth. Reduce the radiotoxic waste from the existing things and use the world fissile stocks of excess weapons grade plutonium and U-235 and so on to help start up these reactors. Uh, use inexhaustible 
thorium fuel, which is available in all nations, giving energy security, and create a walkaway safe reactor. Again, cost is the important thing. We need to have energy cheaper than coal. The designers of that reactor are probably in this room. So I ask of you to remember there's a tipping point here. If you have energy cheaper than coal, we can solve that world climate and population problem because it will be in the economic self-interest of 250 nations to buy those cheaper power sources rather than burning coal. If we don't make that and people find that they want to continue burning coal, then we'll have the scenario that was outlined by Dennis Meadows and the Club of Rome. Uh, thank you, Robert. This is Bob Savinsky from the University of Huddersfield. Unless I missed it, in your talk, you didn't give a comparison of the cost of electricity from a molten salt reactor with that of conventional nuclear, nor, from the, uh, nor, nor a comparison with the cost of using thorium, for example, in conventional, more conventional nuclear reactors. I just wondered if you could comment on that. We know the capital cost of a conventional reactor is about $5 per watt today and the cost of fuel is trivial. So a typical uranium reactor today is competitive with coal, hydro, natural gas, about five or six cents a kilowatt hour. So it is a, a valid and reasonable source of uh, power today. Um, thorium has been used to sort of enhance the lifetime of the fuel rods in previous reactors, and I see no reason why that wouldn't, wouldn't work as well. I was looking at the, um, the cost, your cost for, the, uh, for a lifter reactor, for, for a thermal uh, molten salt reactor. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that really breaks down into the cost of building the reactor and building the reprocessing. And I was wondering if you had any figures uh, of the ratio of those costs. The best I could do was to find those examples I showed you. I don't think we can get a really good cost estimate until we have a really good design, to be honest. I think, however, that the a uh, single fluid reactor is bound to be a lot less expensive and it's probably going to be the first to market. That was a fascinating talk, it's Bryony here at the front. I, I would just say though that um, I think the second half of your presentation gave me great hope and was really fascinating. The first half where you talk about the costs of renewables, I don't see this as a competition between renewables and nuclear. I think they can be complementary and work together. And the reason we're paying a high cost per kilowatt hour at the moment is because we want to exactly do what you've suggested and have that learning curve development. More deployment, costs come down, and you find e e different ways of integrating it into the grid. So I just would say, you know, I, I just, let's try and create a big tent here. Let's try and work together. All low carbon sources should work together, and we've got to beat coal. Um, I think the future for renewables is very bright, and some of the, I, you know, my question, I suppose, is, you know, what do you think about the integration of intermittent sources of renewable energy with storage systems such as heat stores, um, thermal stores being used in homes and businesses, which is what they're doing in Denmark now? We should allow renewables to try to compete in this market, but we shouldn't hide from the public the true cost of what's, what's uh, being paid. So in the long run, we need to cut down the subsidies, particularly for ongoing production uh, costs of electricity. The holy grail for renewables is to be able to store the electric power one day and use it the next. And it's very expensive. The only practical ways, are, and they're not very practical, that I've seen that work at all, are pumped hydro and uh, underground compressed air storage. But both of these uh, lose some energy. Uh, the costs of batteries for storing uh, basically move the decimal point over one when you're trying to look at the cost of electric power. Arrays of windmills can sometimes back each other up because when the wind lulls in one place, it may peak in another. But generally, the storms are correlated, and so the wind does need to have backup from fossil fuel plants. Measurements were taken in Ireland where they were expecting a 12% reduction in CO2 from the wind farm's presence, but in reality, they only observed a 3% reduction. The reason is that the fossil fuels that had to back them up had generators that had to start and stop, and that causes more fuel to be consumed. By analogy, in the US, we have 
cars that have mileages of, say, 20 miles per gallon for city driving and 30 miles per gallon for highway driving. It takes more energy to start and stop the car, just as it takes more fossil fuel energy to stop and start the fossil fuel generation plants. I'm going to talk to you today about using the byproducts of fluoride reactors for medical care, and in particular because I am an oncologist and treat cancer patients for the use in cancer, although we might sneak a couple of non-cancer things in there. Uh, so I am uh, at the University of North Carolina in radiation oncology, also in computer science, and today I'm representing the E-Generation. At the time that X-radiation was discovered, there was a competitor, which was radioactive material coming from natural sources. And we're going to see this competition all through this talk between the stuff that we build, which is the X-ray machines, and stuff that we buy, which is radioactivity. <coughs> What was found in the 19th century were that there were alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles, and they had these properties. And after a little while, it was found that alpha particles are in fact just helium stripped of a couple of electrons, and the beta particles, which were just electrons, and gamma rays, which turned out to be the same as X-rays, which are described by the Maxwell's equations. I remember as a boy thinking, why aren't there other kinds of radiation? Why aren't pr protons ejected or positrons ejected? Why these? And I asked my physics teacher who said, shut up. <laughs> so <laughs> it turns out there are materials like that. But, but very delicate calculations show that alpha particles are the most likely thing uh, to be ejected in decay. And we're going to talk mostly about them. At the end of the 19th century, there were some strange reports started to circulate. People pointed x-ray machines at patients with cancer, and they were getting things like this. This is a lip cancer, and it would go away. And this was a very nasty cancer under the tongue called the floor of mouth cancer. Unfortunately, it's still pretty common. And if you point an x-ray at it uh, uh, long enough, it'll go away. And it's interesting that these medical reports came out within six months after the, uh, Rinkin published his first paper on how to make x-ray machines. Everybody went off and built them in their home laboratory. And, and, and how this was discovered, I have no idea, except I, I think kind of doctors in those days sort of, they had something new, they pointed it at you and see how, what happens, you know? And, and, <laughs> and uh, by the 1930s, what are called orthovoltage machines, and I have $5 for anybody who would tell me why they were called orthovoltage, nobody, nobody seems to know, machines in the 250 keV range, and they were used routinely for cancer treatment, not very successfully, but they were for palliation. Uh, occasionally, you cured a patient by accident. But the competitor, which was originally radium, later on cesium, inserted into the uterine cervix of patients with cervix cancer, was highly curable. And so cervical cancer became the first curable cancer without surgery. <clears throat> In analyzing this, it was discovered that the cervix cancer treatments were getting a lot more radiation than were the external beam patients. And so it was decided to try to see if you could increase the energy of x-rays, which needs to be done if you want to give higher doses for a number of reasons. And in the 1960s, the Van de Graaff machine came into being and produced a million electron volts and treated patients successfully. But nature struck back with radioactive cobalt, which was at 1.27 and 1.33 MeV, and its decay process of cobalt into nickel. You, it's a nice way of illustrating it for physicians. You guys don't need this. Okay, and um, that, yeah, somebody finally got it. All right, yeah. that, um, they don't actually look like this, the decay products, but. Um, so radioactive cobalt became, uh, the, and that was taken actually in Canada, really built the first machines. They even put it on a postage stamp over here. And I am old enough so that I trained on treating patients with radioactive cobalt, and we did cure a lot of cancer with it. There, there's no question about that. But in time, that gave rise uh, to the Betatron, which would crank energies up to 35 million electron volts, and I'd like to also point out decibel level to 100.
100 uh, decibels at least. My own thought was that the cancer cure rate came from the noise of the machine rather than the x-rays because it just <laughs> shook the patient to death. Uh, today, a modern linear accelerator that is used to treat t uh, cancer patients, it runs between 6 and 15 MeV. It turns out if you go over 15 MeV, you start making radioactive oxygen in the air and, and you get neutron contamination. That's probably not a good idea. Um, they're versatile, quiet, and they're reliable, and a few million dollars will buy you one of these things. And those are now standard uh, treatment. And why this push for higher energy? Well, it has to do with the depth dust curves. Um, this is 250 keV. In order to get 100 to the tumor, you've got to crank about 200 into the surface of the patient, and their skin falls off after a while. Medically, this is not a good thing. If you use, yeah, it, it, the patients get upset. And if, if, if you cobalt 60, though, not only do you, it only takes maybe 150% at the skin level, but in fact, cobalt skips the first few millimeters, and that has to do with electron equilibrium, which in fact, when this was noted medically, the physicist said impossible, and the physicians kept saying, but, but they're not getting skin reactions. And the physicists went back and realized that loss of electronic equilibrium in the first few millimeters meant the skin dose was low, and it really made it possible to get high doses into the patient. And as you crank up the energy, clearly you get more and more energy into the tumor and less and less on the surface. And so this is better and better. And you get more sparing of the skin, too. Here are some nice pictures of the cancer of the larynx. You see this kind of thing all the time in smokers. You treat them with the radiation, it's gone. Here's a small lung cancer that's seen on CT scan right here. It's treated with a technique called radiosurgery. And uh, after about a year, it all disappears except for a little scar tissue. Here's an advanced lung cancer, which was the thing I specialized in so much, where there were big amounts of tumor right on the, the mediastinum, and you, you treat it with radiation, and sometimes you get a response like that, and the patient will be cured. <clears throat> here's, here's a terrible breast cancer. I saw a lot of these in the early days, and been treated with radiation and, and uh, cured of the disease. Another particle that was used was the beta particle, or electrons. Electrons have a terrifically nice thing that they just fall off like a waterfall, and they don't go very deep. They know very little skin sparing, though. Um, and so you somebody with a very extensive skin cancer like this, you treat it with an electron beam, and uh, you can cure them. And you don't want to use an x-ray here, because if you x point an x-ray through here, it'll go through the brain. No, that's not a good thing. But can we do better than x-rays? The answer is yes. Here's protons. If you take protons, because of the Bragg peak, they will tend to bump up and then crash. The dose crashes. They don't get much past the Bragg peak. And you have to widen the Bragg peak out a little bit because that's very tight and the tumors are, uh, have some macroscopic dimensions. And that the price you pay there is you get an entrance dose. But protons are, are great. Um, they are also horribly expensive. They're extremely clumsy. I've, I've actually worked with these things. Uh, it's very difficult, and there's a big rush now to build proton facilities, and there are about 15 of them in the United States now. The nearest one here is in Virginia, and the uh, private enterprises, because they get very, very good reimbursement on these. Here is one of the earlier uses of protons, the melanoma in the eye, and you treat it with a, a proton beam. You do that so that you can spare the rest of the eye, and the person had about 80% of the vision, whereas the standard treatment would be taken out surgically, and then you have no vision, right? But protons aren't any better than x-rays. Biologically, they're the same, and there are a lot of tumors that are still very resistant to x-rays. Uh, neutrons, on the other hand, are a different deal. Uh, neutrons are killers. I mean, they are what are called high LAT radiation. They don't fall off uh, the way x-rays do, uh, gently, but they fall off like more like protons. They just, and um, they're very, very active, and no mammalian cell can really survive a, a neutron dose. So there's no such thing as resi tumor resistance to neutrons. And here's an example of a patient uh, of mine that had a big, huge tumor like that of a cell type that was known to be very, very resistant to x-rays. And I sent him to Seattle where they had a neutron facility, and he came back like that, and a very good response. But you can do better. The trouble with neutrons is they're very difficult to control. These are uncharged particles. It's hard to, to collimate them. It's hard to deal with them. Uh, but if supposing you have high LAT radiation with charged particles, let's say carbon-12. Let me go back here. Then you can get a dose distribution curve like this 
where you have no entrance dose and no exit dose, and you can, it's almost like a surgical knife. You can go in there with a carbon uh, beam of high LAT uh, particles, and you'll kill everything in that section. The, here's a schematic of one of them, and I added a little device in here just to kind of show you what the problem was, and in case you don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> here's a better a blow-up of the picture. These things are hundreds of millions of dollars, and I suspect when you build the facilities and you add the, the, the team of en nuclear engineers, and I, I, you guys will not work for minimum wage anymore, um, it turns out these things are horribly expensive, and as far as I know, there's only one or two in the world. Uh, and because they're so large, they're very difficult to work in a medical environment. So let's go back to nature. We've been dealing with this buy and build thing where we build the machines and the nature retaliates and says I have something better. Could we go back to nature and maybe get it for free? Are there, in fact, alpha radiation sources in nature? And as you know, I counted recently, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I counted about 150. All right, so carbon uh, boron neutron capture it was, has been done. Uh, That's where you flood the patient with boron, you, you uh, put neutrons in there, and um, it, it, you can kill the tumor very nicely, and it was catastrophic because you can't keep the boron out of other areas, and patients died hideous deaths, and this was tried multiple times and given up. <clears throat> but there might be a better way. Antibodies to the tumor antibodies carrying nuclear weapons to the tumor. And why does this work? Alpha particles are deadly because so much energy entering the cell destroys it. And I did a little calculation here. A stick of dynamite has an energy density of about 1,000 joules per cubic meter. And an a single alpha particle has a density about the same because its range is so short that it, it will uh, destroy an entire cell. So if it only takes one alpha particle to kill a cell, you're in business. <clears throat> so people are considering this for leukemia. The standard way to treat leukemia these days, if you have aggressive leukemia, is to give a whole lot of drugs to kill all the bone marrow and then new bone marrow transplant. This is not pleasant, and I can tell you that from personal experience because I went through this three and a half years ago. These are not good things to put into people. An alternative is antibodies attached to nuclear weapons that will destroy the patient's bone marrow, but not much of anything else if the antibodies are primed only to do the bone marrow and uh, then transplant them. And there are a lot of research going on on this area. Just one just published a few days ago by Actinium Pharmaceuticals that uses Actinium-225, which is, in fact, I think the wrong isotope. So the properties that alpha particles have to have, uh, availability, a uh, uh, half-life that's medically usable, and it turns out Bismuth 213 and Actinium-225 are on, among some of the best, and they're only available in lifters. Now here's the decay scheme of uranium-233 and Actinium-225 and Bismuth 213 are prominent in the decay scheme, and that is about the only way you really can obtain this stuff. So one of the things about the lifters is we may be able to make materials that are good for leukemia, that are good for other kinds of, of uh, cancers, and maybe someday that will be the way we treat metastatic cancer disease by having antibodies of high specificity carrying little nuclear weapons to destroy the tumors. Skipping very quickly to diagnostic nuclear medicine. There is Technetium uh, 99M, which is the backbone, the workhorse of nuclear medicine. Uh, this is the kind of thing you do. Here's a patient that we thought was cured, and then a few months later, that's what his bone scan looks like. Uh, very unfortunate for the patient. The reason this works is that bones have these cells called osteoblasts in them, and they take up calcium like crazy if there's inflammation, which there is when the cancer's in the bone. Um, they also take up technetium because they don't know the difference. They also, by the way, uh, take up uh, radium as well. And so there is a drug, uh, an alpha emitter, Zofigo, which is out on the market and is FDA approved. But there's a critical shortage of technetium. It is made overseas. It is made in aging reactors that require uh, enriched uranium, which we can no longer export after some date. I don't know what the exact date is. We can't export that. And it turns out, and this fits in, into your talk, that one of the byproducts of, of, of the um, 
lifter is this stuff here. Molybdenum 99 and technetium 99M is just a byproduct, a contaminant. Fish that stuff out and you will solve the problem. And uh, uh, Bill Thesley and I did a calculation in the back of the envelope and we thought that one or two lifters, just a couple of gigawatt reactors, would supply all the technetium that the United States needs and uh, we would no longer be in this severe crisis mode by 2018 or 19. They think there's not going to be any of this technetium back at all. So, we rest our case. <laughs> you gave it, leukemia as an example of one of the conditions that would be treatable by you know, some of these advanced ideas. But I'm just wondering if myeloproliferative diseases would be included in that. And the answer is yes, uh, myeloproliferative diseases. Are, it, it, Mother told you that there was cancer and not cancer. It turns out mother was not quite telling you the truth. There is a progression from normal cells to frank malignancies. And what he says, myeloproliferative disease, with a very sophisticated term, is in fact one of these intermediate diseases that are very, very bad for the patient. And they end up transfusion dependent, and eventually most of them degenerate into leukemia. In my case, that did not happen. Um, and myelodysplastic diseases are sometimes, when the patients get transfusion dependent, they do have to have a marrow transplant. It is the only known way to cure them. And that, to get a marrow transplant means you've got to get the old marrow out of there because if you just take somebody else's marrow and put it in there, your own bone marrow will fight it tooth and nail and destroy it. Okay, so you've got to clear it out. The only way we know of, of clearing that out today is through use of these highly toxic drugs. I had six of them because I failed the first time and I kind of failed the second time and it was really the third time before we actually got it cleared out enough so that I could get a transplant. And the transplants are the thing that actually mop it up. Uh, but that clearing out process. Now, the reason I think actinium-225 is wrong is I think you need a shorter-acting isotope because if you're going to clear this out, you don't want that stuff hanging around so that when you put in the donor bone marrow, it has to deal with it. Bismuth-213 seems to me to be perfect. It's about, about eight-hour half-life or something. So about a week, the patient's going to go without marrow, and the hospitals can cope with that and then transplant it. And the... The, the bismuth wouldn't go anywhere else, so the patient wouldn't, wouldn't have two years of recovery from the chemotherapy. And may I make the business case for you, Julian, with an eight-hour half-life, is there any point in trying to get that from a solid-fueled reactor? You actually get it from actinium is the way you do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, if, and if I might add, think about how many millions of dollars per kilo <laughs> something that hangs around for only eight hours and is only present in trace amounts, like less than one pico curie, you know, in a whole load, like, of the uranium in the Congo. Think about how many millions of dollars per kilo that will add up to. So that's not a business case. I don't know what it is. Well, one of the things I was intrigued about is if you look the list of things that are made by a lifter, they include platinum, so that's another waste metal, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, both entertaining and informative. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs>